Carbon in the oceans is incredibly significant. It accounts for 38,700 gigatons or billion tons of carbon. And in addition to that, there are about 6,000 gigatons of carbon which um, are deposited in the seafloor sediments which build up in the ocean basins. It's bigger than all the fossil fuels put together and it's bigger than all the other stores of soil and also all the carbon which is in the atmosphere, all the carbon that is in every land plant. Carbon comes to be in the uh, oceans, the upper oceans, by the process of diffusion. Carbon diffuses from the ocean surface into the uh, oceans and um, that process is then very key for the life in the upper oceans in this area where there is light. So in the sunlit upper layers of the ocean, phytoplankton and other algae fix carbon into their skeletons. Um, these little microorganisms form at the very bottom of the food chain. They can then be eaten by organisms like fish or sharks or whales. And then there's two routes for the carbon which is found in the phytoplankton. Either it can settle out on the seabed when the little microorganisms die, or it could be eaten by other organisms, marine organisms, which subsequently die. This is called the biological pump. Carbon dissolves in the ocean at the surface, it's absorbed into the skeletons and process of photosynthesis, and it's extremely significant. So we know that in the atmosphere we've got carbon dioxide rising, it's now at 407 parts per million, um, but the um, phytoplankton absorb 10 gigatons of carbon, um, and then they tr pump it to the deep oceans each year. Um, you might be thinking, how can something which is microscopic, then this one, a coccolith, it's only a thousandth of a millimetre across. It's about 10 microns in size. They're preserved because millions and millions and billions of them settle out on the sea floor. They're preserved mainly in the relatively shallow oceans, where the ocean is very deep and the calcium carbonate, which the skeleton is formed from, actually redissolves and the carbon enters back into the ocean. So we know that the growth of phytoplankton are controlled by the availability of light. They need light, they need to be in the upper ocean, but they also need nutrients. And at certain times of the year, um, currents um, from the deep ocean bring nutrients into um, the upper ocean. Um, you can see here the Bristol Channel, you can see here also the Wash, and Lincolnshire and then down into Norfolk. These bright areas shown up on the satellite image show a bloom of phytoplankton in the ocean. Um, and this will allow many, many um, phytoplankton to increase because there's more nutrients in the ocean. These show up in the satellite image because they reflect the light um, more than um, other oceans which have less phytoplankton in them. Here we have the biological pump and here we have the build-up here of um, uh, many, many millions of coccoliths which have formed uh, chalk. <coughs> this is a major sink in the ocean sediments. We also have carbonates on the land, so all kinds of limestone, zoolitic limestones and chalk which are weathered, that passes into the ocean, the ocean sediments build up on the seafloor. So you might be thinking, how is it if so much um, carbon is building up in the seafloor, how does it <clears throat> get back into the atmosphere again? The answer is plate tectonics. So you'll know some plates are pulling apart, <clears throat> some plates are converging. Here we've got a subduction zone, this plate is being subducted, an oceanic plate is being subducted underneath a continental plate. Convection currents are carrying this plate down into the mantle. We've got earthquakes as that plate descends into the, into the Earth's mantle. Um, with it go not just the plate, the crystal plate, but also the sediments, the wet sediments. These wet, carbon-rich sediments are being carried down. And as it descends, it, it experiences increased temperature and increased pressure. Um, so it's heated by the Earth's heat flux and the pressure um, also increases. As the pressure increases, water is released from those sediments. When that water is released from the sediments, it leads to the melting of the mantle wedge and magma starts to accumulate. As that process takes place, alongside that we also have the release of carbon from minerals which are in the Earth's um, mantle here they start to mobilise and to partially melt and migrate into magma chambers. This then um, produces carbon dioxide in the dissolved magma chamber. As it rises, the pressure is released and then it comes out of, um, it's been under pressure, it comes out and becomes a gas again. And then as the volcano erupts, it's released back into the atmosphere. 
So what sort of feedbacks are set up by the um, emissions of carbon dioxide into the high atmosphere by volcanic eruptions? Here we have 2001, this is the eruption of um, Mount Pinatubo, which is where the Pacific and the Philippine Plate, um, Pacific Plate is being subducted underneath the Philippine Plate, um, and a giant eruption occurred in 2001, releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, included in this vast gas cloud. So it's erupting millions of tonnes of carbon dioxide, an estimated um, between 280 and 360 million tonnes of carbon dioxide are erupted every single year into the atmosphere. So you might think, we know carbon dioxide has the green, it initiates the greenhouse effect, trapping um, incoming solar radiation and preventing um, that heat escaping back into space. You might think this is going to heat the atmosphere. In fact, what happened was this eruption caused a 0.6 degree uh, cooling. So the global temperatures were minus 0.6 degrees for around 10 months of the year, the following year following the eruption. And that was because along with the carbon dioxide, we also have sulfur dioxide and we also have ash. Those particles, those both the sulfur dioxide aerosol and the ash, um, both absorb and reflect incoming solar radiation, meaning that actually there's less um, uh, heat reaching the Earth's surface. Finally, let's think about the physical pump. So here we have the equator. As we move north from the equator, we have surface currents carrying warm water from the surface oceans here where most in, um, heating is most intense from solar insulation to the North Pole and the same in the Southern Hemisphere to the South Pole to Antarctica. This is very simplified, but at a global scale, we see the cycling of warm water moving north when it reaches the um, poles here, the North Pole, the Arctic Ocean, we get downwelling currents. The ocean currents carry water down into the deep oceans. When they carry water into the deep oceans, they carry with them carbon dioxide. This represents the downwelling or the physical pump of carbon dioxide being stored here in the deep ocean. When um, those deep oceans oceans circulate they circulate very very slowly over hundreds of years but carbon is then released back into the surface waters the deep oceans do represent a place where potentially carbon dioxide could be stored and there are researchers working currently on the idea of pumping carbon dioxide into the deep ocean where it would be stored in a lake because the gas would be under pressure in the deep ocean and therefore would be a liquid this is your summary slide. I'd encourage you to press pause now and then complete the next activity. Now it's your chance to review your understanding. Look at these words and these phrases and see if you can talk your own way through the storage of carbon in the oceans.